Welcome to the Public Philosophy Series for Living Philosophy, which explores with academic guests philosophical ideas that matter to our everyday life. The Public Philosophy episodes are distinguishable from our regular episodes by the bespoke thumbnail artwork provided by the Tour Studios. If you like our podcast, please take the time to rate it, give it five stars, and help spread the word. I'm your host, Dr. Todd May. Throughout the life of this podcast, we've talked quite a bit about a branch of philosophy called hermeneutics. And in this episode, we're finally going to delve deeper into what hermeneutics is and why it matters. But first, just a primer in case you've forgotten what hermeneutics is about. The term hermeneutics has its origin in the ancient Greek language. And you may have noticed that part of its root is awfully close to the name of the Greek god Hermes, the so-called messenger of the gods. This coincidence is no accident as hermeneutics is essentially about interpreting messages or learning how to interpret language, symbols, actions, and even reality. As a discipline, hermeneutics originally started as a religious scholastic exercise in trying to determine the rules of interpreting sacred scripture. For example, one rule of hermeneutics that derives from the early church fathers of Christianity, roughly from the first century to the mid eighth century, is that the literal meaning of scripture is only one level of meaning. Moreover, the literal level is often surpassed by other kinds of meaning. In other words, literal meaning is not the only way to determine what has been written or said. And hermeneutics understands from the start that literal meanings of sentences are only a building block to understanding other non-literal meanings. And this doesn't just have to do with religion. Everyday sentences that are ironical, sarcastic, metaphorical, or poetic, all of these rely on grasping literal meaning only in order to move beyond it. When was the last time you heard someone say their head was about to explode? You probably knew right away that they didn't literally mean their head was going to detonate or burst, but rather that they probably had an excruciating headache. To move from the literal to non-literal meaning is to participate in doing hermeneutics. And hermeneutics can be found in almost any religious tradition that seeks to move past literal meanings of its central texts. By the late 19th century, hermeneutics separated from its religious anchoring, and what began to emerge is what scholars call philosophical hermeneutics. Philosophical hermeneutics inherits the interest in how to interpret what is said and written, but it then adds on several other layers of concern. In short, it sees most everything we do and most everything to which we relate as interpretable. That is, to borrow from Paul Ricoeur, we see the world and others as texts to be read and interpreted. An interesting proposition, but there is so much more that needs to be explained. Perhaps philosophy can help us gain a clearer understanding of why hermeneutics matters. I'd like to welcome three guests to help us with this aim. Professor Andrea Dechu Ritavoy, is from the English department at Carnegie Mellon University in the United States. Her specializations include rhetorical theory and continental philosophy, narrative and identity, and exile and transnationalism. Two of her more recent publications include the books, Yesterday's Self, Nostalgia and Immigrant Experience with Roman and Littlefield, and Paul Ricoeur, Tradition and Innovation in Rhetorical Theory with the State University of New York Press. Professor David Dutzler teaches at North Central Texas College in the United States. David's research interests lie in philosophical hermeneutics, critical theory, and environmental philosophy. He has a number of publications in venues like Philosophy Today, Environmental Philosophy, and a book with Fordham University Press entitled Interpreting Nature, of which he is also a co-editor. David is also a former guest on the Living Philosophy podcast, where he discussed the topic of rights and recognition. Professor Nicholas Davey is Emeritus Professor of Philosophy at the University of Dundee in Scotland. He is regarded as one of the world's foremost authorities on the philosophy of Hans Jörg Gadamer. And in addition, Nicholas specializes in aesthetics, the philosophy of art, and the application of hermeneutics to a broad range of ideas and disciplines, including religion, language, and the practice of teaching. He is author of numerous books and articles, including the award-winning Unfinished Worlds, Hermeneutics, Aesthetics, and Gadamer with Edinburgh University Press. And he has a forthcoming book entitled Unquiet Practices, Hermeneutics, and the Question of Negativity with Bloomsbury Press. Andrea, David, and Nicholas, welcome to Living Philosophy. 
Thank you. Thank you for your Thank kind you. words. A bit about your personal intellectual connection to hermeneutics. What does hermeneutics mean to each of you, and why is the act of interpretation so important? One of the fascinating things about, for me, about hermeneutic, it is a, a quite a astonishing mix of ideas on levels of abstract generality with one's own personal experience, with one's understanding of the world on a very individual level, depending upon which corner of the world one is in. I came across hermeneutics when I was an undergraduate. I was primarily a student of history. And the, the, the ribald story I have about hermeneutics is simply that I, I got a bit fed up with trying to study how people shot one another in political history. I wanted to know a bit more about why people were doing such things to one another. So that was a, a time in which I became aware of the philosophy of history through a man called Gordon Leff, who wrote... Uh, one of the early English works on historical hermeneutics. More broadly speaking, I think it, I got interested in hermeneutics because, like lots of people, I was um, a bit confused. I was in the 60s at university. I came from a rather Victorian, staid background. All the values that uh, I was brought up with were up in the air, being questioned. There was a mismatch between uh, what lots of people were thinking and how people were living. And also at that time, living in Britain, there was a sense in which one was living uh, in circumstances which were dominated by things I couldn't see, namely the Second World War, which was a, a huge epochal event. And it shaped things like the number of churches I could see in London, the number of bomb holes, people walking around with war wounds. All those things became explicable in terms of what I couldn't see. In other words, on those three levels, being a student, being a historian, uh, living, living in London uh, as a teenager, experience was complex. It was multi-layered. It wasn't schizophrenic or broken apart from, from, from itself. It was more that there were these crisscrossing of currents of ideas, circumstances, and contents, so to speak. And I think I became absolutely fascinated with hermeneutics when, I have to say, after a few years, I only got a bit of the sense of how complex it was, as I realised that really hermeneutics is fundamentally trying to not to understand what I would, what sometimes is called lived experience, but it's trying to understand what is living experience, following it through, tracing through all its tensions, seeing how things that one perhaps had neglected shape one now and indeed orientate one in a very particular way to the future in a way perhaps I don't fully understand. But it, that exciting sense of participating in something, not quite understanding the full dynamics of what one was participating in, and yet finding that philosophical hermeneutics in particular had a way of mapping out the complexities of experience and allowing one to engage with it more fully. So that's just a background to how, how not I found hermeneutics, but I think hermeneutics found me. I, I, was, I was drawn into the ontological circumstances of hermeneutics, and I still find myself right in the middle of it. A few things about my first encounter with hermeneutics and acknowledge that I think I had been engaged in hermeneutic work uh, without necessarily realizing it because my background is in uh, literature in literary criticism. And I think literary criticism and hermeneutics obviously have a lot in common insofar as they are both guided by an effort to make sense of language, especially language in um, its most complex manifestations. I think both literature and hermeneutics start with the premise that language is ambiguous and that we um, most often cannot take words at face value. So an expression like the one you gave as an example, Todd, my head was about to explode, might sound like it's more of, a, of an exception, but in fact, it's not. It's actually far more common than anything that we might be looking for as being denotative. And language in, in uh, literary expression is, of course, very much focused 
on figures. It's very much focused on connotations. So as someone trained in literary criticism in Eastern Europe, I'm originally from Romania, at the very end of the Cold War, I was particularly drawn to theories of interpretation that were very much focused on language and on philosophical ideas, and perhaps less so on uh, ideology. Now, little did I know that, in fact, I would come back to hermeneutics in connection to ideology later on when I studied Paul Ricoeur. But hermeneutics for someone like me at that point in time and in that place was very attractive because it seemed to be far more focused on text than on any kind of political agenda. It, it came with a kind of freedom, a kind of emancipation for a particular ideological canon, which was very much controlled by the socialist state at the time. So I think it was a, a bit of an escape. And at the same time, it was an escape for someone doing literary criticism, but less interested in passing judgment. And I was growing up in a tradition where the literary critic comes into decide whether a piece of literary work is good or bad. I was more interested in the meaning-making effort rather than in the verdict. And hermeneutics was so focused on, uh, on meaning rather than value, as I encountered it in the beginning, that again, it was very, uh, very much emancipatory for someone like me at the time. I actually entered hermeneutics not through Gadamer, but rather through Paul Ricoeur. And, uh, and through Paul Ricoeur, the author of works on narrative. And it was then through the narrative form that I later discovered his work on hermeneutics and then eventually found my way to Gadamer. And when I did, it was very rewarding because I discovered the great role of literature that play that the great role that literature plays for Gadamer as the examples that he analyzes philosophically. I was especially interested in the relationship between hermeneutics and aesthetics and Gadamer's applications to poetry. Uh, so I think that connection between aesthetic expression and craft, literary craft on the one hand, and hermeneutics as an effort to understand what does not jump at you as readily um, available for comprehension has been the, the greatest joy of my professional efforts and Something that I worry about a little bit nowadays as an active academic, I worry about the role that hermeneutics currently has in academic curricula, where it's taught, whether it's taught, how it is taught. So another reason for me to be delighted to have this conversation. I'm starting to feel a bit more vindicated in my career path in academia. I was an undergraduate student at UC Berkeley, one of the most prestigious English departments uh, at that time. I don't know if it still is. Perhaps Andrea can comment on that with a facial gesture. It's great to hear Andrea talk about the interest in meaning because I was a literary student just because I wanted to just engage with interpreting texts and arguing and justifying certain meanings that arise as you read it. And I was told point blank, there is no such thing as meaning in a text by as an undergraduate. And I was told in other circles, if I decided to write on that kind of thing, I was not gonna do very well in my degree. And of course, me being stubborn, like I am, and people who know me, I'm going to, uh, my back's going to get up and I'm going to write about meaning. And it so happened that I had a colleague uh, from the United Kingdom who knew about the kinds of things I was suffering. And he sent me an essay called, What is a Text? And it was a Paul Ricoeur article on hermeneutics. And that just opened things up. I, I started to see not just ways of reading texts, but also um, good arguments as to why you would want to look for meaning in texts and so forth. I think there's some similar stories going on here about hermeneutics having found us. Uh, for me, uh, you know, Recur said in one place that hermeneutics comes in when meaning is not apparent, but rather there are levels of meaning, you know, uh, beneath the surface. And just a kind of an anecdote uh, regarding language not being clear. Uh, back in a former life, I knew an Anglican archbishop. And he had had, he told the story of having invited a miss, missionary to come in and talk to his congregation for, uh, you know, a few nights. And the first night he asked him what he wanted for dinner before they went off uh, to the service. And being in the United States, the missionary said, well, I, I would like to try a pizza. So, uh, of course, this was back in the days when you had to pick up a phone and order the pizza rather than on an app or online. So he called on the phone and he said, he ordered the pizza and he said, We're, uh, we have a commitment, uh, a little bit of a hurry. Uh, could you please step on it? And after he got off the phone, the missionary asked him, he said, why did you ask him to step on the pizza? You know, so, you know, again, language is not always 
a parent, there could be multiple uh, meanings. And for me, my background coming into hermeneutics, uh, also in my undergrad, uh, I was drawn into philosophy initially with an introduction to phenomenology. Uh, so I went to a school that focused on phenomenology, and I took one course called Husserl and his Commentators. And one of the essays that we read was Paul Ricoeur's essay on phenomenology and hermeneutics. Uh, it's in both from text to action and also hermeneutics and human sciences. And I really hadn't read anything like that before. So that drew me in and I began to read uh, Ricoeur, obviously then on to Gadamer and then other hermeneutic uh, figures, but primarily Ricoeur and Gadamer there. And one of the things that began to fascinate me about hermeneutics was this idea that uh, very much kind of what Andrea was saying that there isn't necessarily a right or wrong answer coming in to tell what is a good text, a bad text, but ra rather, and Recur was very good about doing this, uh, talking about even positions that held a certain amount of tension between them and trying to maintain that tension, see where the other is speaking from, and uh, rather than just choosing one or the other necessarily. Uh, Recur, one of his principles of philosophizing was that even someone he vehemently disagrees with probably has a kernel of truth that I need to address or deal with. And he was in some times generous to a fault, uh, which I think sometimes comes back on him. Ricoeur tends to get dismissed a lot because he dialogues with people that, well, you know, you're not supposed to be dialoguing with if you come from this tradition, this or that. Uh, so, yeah, just from that point uh, onward, for me, it was... Um, Hermeneutics began to explain a number of things. As I began to get into environmental philosophy, I saw what hermeneutics could uh, contribute to that or questions of environmental uh, justice. And it's just been a, a, a life. It underlies everything else I do, whether it's explicitly hermeneutical or not. For audience members who are not quite familiar with the history of philosophy in the 20th century, uh, it's uh, a matter that uh, the three guests are specialists in philosophical hermeneutics. So we are talking about two main figures in particular, Hans-Jörg Gadamer, a German philosopher, Paul Ricoeur, a French philosopher, but probably of all the French philosophers, he's the most German. And I, I, I will just say, because his writing style tends to be more like uh, what you would read, well, for me, reading in translation in English, German philosophy, and he did take very seriously the German tradition. Uh, and he was a prisoner of war during World War II, where he was allowed to read German philosophy. So uh, that's what he studied up on, as it were. Uh, and there's another rather controversial figure we haven't mentioned who's also central to the uh, philosophical hermeneutics of the 20th century, and that is the German philosopher Martin Heidegger. But um, I'll not talk about the controversy. That's sort of a, a, a dead horse, as it were. It's been talked about quite a bit in other circles. But just for the sake of the audience's information, those are the three main uh, hermeneutical philosophers within the 20th century. And we've been talking a lot about the ways in which hermeneutics is both practical and liberating for each of you, respectively. And I'm wondering if we can move from kind of a general landscape of what hermeneutics is, how it's featured in your careers and your lives, to some specificity about moments you can remember or recall where hermeneutics has really made a difference academically within your discipline, whether it was some kind of epiphany that you've had or a group of you had a, a fellow scholars in a research program, or it was some major contribution to your field of study. And I think it's, for me, it has to be the relationship between my teaching and hermeneutics. For me, teaching hermeneutics wasn't just a matter of presenting it in philosophy classes. I used to present hermeneutics in art schools, primarily talking, of course, about um, the nature of visual meaning. And where I began quickly to become aware of its influence, that is hermeneutics, is when we try to, in a sense, deconstruct the visual orientation of early students who were in many ways convinced that what they had learned about art at high school was the absolute truth of Western art, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And there was nothing beyond impressionism. I can remember many, many, many sessions and seminars when hermeneutically orientated experiments and arguments would literally make people before your very eyes, experience changing how they saw things. And I, I think it was that experience of seeing other people suddenly seeing things differently that for me was practically the most experientially powerful instance of how hermeneutics works. Sometimes I used to pick it up at school with my own teachers, although I wasn't able to 
uh, be eloquent about it now, but you could sometimes sense in someone's eyes when they're thinking about something changed. And it was almost as if a point in their existential orientation was shifting right before you, depending upon you wanted whether you wanted to talk in terms of the language of Diltai or Gadama. It's actually visually experiencing a shift in someone's understanding. And when you see that, and when you see that vulnerability in someone who's prepared to indicate to you that their horizons are, are, are shifting, it, it, it is a miraculous experience. And in a sense, their opening of a door towards you opens my doors towards them as well. So I, I think it's in the experience of interpersonal exchange and teaching for me that hermeneutical devices, shall I say, have been the most productive and the, mo and the most transformative. Nicholas, if I could just follow up with one question. So it seems like in my, well, certainly in my experience, engaging in hermeneutics of trying to understand other positions, being open to other interpretations, and being able to question your own convictions and biases, whether you're aware of them or not, requires a lot of humility in any of the parties involved in the, in the exercise that would involve yeah. the hermeneutical approach. Did you have any ways of any exercises or any special rhetorical tactics that allowed for the space to admit humility amongst the discussants or the interlocutors? Because a lot of times, especially in academic settings, and, and maybe it depends on what academic institution you're at, an Oxford or a Harvard versus where I used to teach, which is a very middling university, sorry, University of Kent of that, if you feel offended by that, but you were. <laughs> um, there's gonna be different obstacles to letting one's guard down in order to be able to discuss things. So can you say anything about your experiences with breaking down those obstacles of reticence and insecurity. A willingness to make a fool of oneself. <laughs> I, think, I think that's that's that that that's always something that students find very attractive. If the so-called professor of the department comes in and and is prepared to make a fool of himself, it's a way of letting other people know that you can exist without your defences. And it's perfectly possible to do so. And I don't, and nobody else really gains that much by me keeping those defences up all the time. There were other humorous devices, like um, early remarks to young students would be, I'm the person here who's here to make your life more difficult. <laughs> and then sort of try to explain the complexities of that. Or if I thought I was losing something, and, and maybe this is a bit below the belt, if I really wanted to keep attention, if I would indicate that I was going to tell them something about my sex life, and then, and, and then the audience in the room would go absolutely quiet. You could hear a pin drop for 10 minutes or so. So that was another way of, in a sense, um, being prepared to, in a sense, be a Shakespearean buffoon, but with very serious intent, namely to show, show that, that my willingness to open up was a way of, of, in a sense, wanting to say, please share what I am saying to you with me as well, a sort of dialogical exchange with, of course, a, a degree of risk. But there, I think humour comes into it, that you're not promoting any particular position that you were prepared to think about other positions as well. Sure, it had its rhetorical devices, but you asked me what mine were, so I've given my game away. I have to think some new ones up now. <laughs> one of the things, and I stole this from one of my undergrad professors, but I'll tell my students that I do stand-up philosophy, you know, rather than stand-up comedy. And uh, when I come into an intro class, uh, the first thing I think, I feel a weight of responsibility when I teach because I've talked to so many people, so many adults, they took one philosophy class in college and decided they hated philosophy for the rest of their lives. And I thought, I don't want to be that professor that causes them to hate philosophy. And where hermeneutics really comes in at the very beginning, uh, usually the first lectures I do before we jump into some of the standard text you do in an intro class, just talk about what philosophy is. And I don't talk about hermeneutics, but the first thing that I tell my students is that you don't know anything. And as soon as you know you don't know anything, <laughs> like Socrates, you're going to begin to be able to learn. And one of the devices that I use, a basic you know, pedagogy, I will tell them that you don't know, you don't learn anything new except through things you already know. For example, if someone walks in a, if an anthropologist walks in a cave and sees writing on a cave and he recognizes that as writing on a cave a wall, 
Uh, he already had to have a concept of writing before he could recognize what those figures were to be that. So the lesson from that for my students is, is that you need to know from the beginning what you know or your understanding of things is simply limited. And it's the process of philosophy to reach those limits of understanding. You know, and then what, you know, Gadamer, of course, would talk about the fusion of, of horizons and, you know, where you where you encounter another person. Gadamer said this is the, uh, or not just another person, any world experience or event. You don't say the limits of my horizon are therefore nothing else can be said, but it becomes the place of your openness to the world. And you become an attentive listener to the voice of the other. And so that's how I try to set the tone for uh, all of my classes from the very you know first week of, of classes. So in that way, hermeneutics uh, really informs pretty much everything that I do with my very beginning students. I've had a different experience with hermeneutics academically because I don't teach in a philosophy department. I teach in an English department, which incidentally taught uh, still sees hermeneutics as a bit of heresy. I don't think it's changed quite that much. And I also tend to teach hermeneutics not necessarily as a wholesale class, but at least you know certain hermeneutics texts to graduate students, to especially to PhD students. And it's a hard sell, I have to say. And not so much because of the difficulty of the readings, but because of the theoretical assumptions. So I think, you know, the, the various schools of thought in my field that have focused so much on what happens at the surface of language and see going deep into some sort of hidden level of meaning as uh, problematic in terms of the very assumption that we're making, which kind of dichotomizes surface and depth, has not been a very hospitable place from which to start to teach hermeneutics. Of course, you can challenge that perspective on hermeneutics, and that's to some extent what I do. I also like to introduce students to hermeneutics by using a kind of history of philosophy approach where I point out the interesting controversies that hermeneutics has been a part of. And then we reflect on what has made it controversial and what makes it prominent, or on the contrary, what gives it a kind of secondary status compared to other fields. So, you know, I, I like to talk to students about the fact that Paul Ricoeur allegedly lost his bid for a chairship at Collège de France to Michel Foucault. And then we talk about how much Foucault really disliked hermeneutics as a philosophical enterprise, precisely because he was so focused on on discourse rather than meaning. And then we go into why we would differentiate discourse from meaning. So I think that makes for some interesting discussions. But ultimately, when I feel that I can, quote unquote, win the students over (laughs) to the hermeneutic side. Uh, And I wish I had such clever, funny tactics as my colleagues here, and maybe I will employ them in the future. But where I feel that I can win them over is really on uh, two levels. One of them is I like to talk about hermeneutics in relationship to self-understanding. So there is a lot that I cover as well that looks at just understanding different perspectives. But I think hermeneutics is especially ideal for helping you make sense of your own position, of your own assignment of your prejudice, your bias. And and really, it becomes a very productive way of understanding identity. I find the students very open to that idea. I think there is a great deal of fascination with selfhood and with self-identity. And I think hermeneutics has been especially prominent in that regard. For me, that's been the revelation, as you put it, Todd. That's where I felt that my interest in identity and displacement, so identity that's kind of fragmented and um, threatened by various uh, ways of living experience. For me, it's always been the experience of uprootedness has been a very interesting way of of reflection. And I I also like to point out in a field like mine, which is rhetoric, that hermeneutics is the ideal complement to argumentation. Because when you're no longer assuming that to interpret is to understand one given meaning, but rather to see multiple possibilities, you are getting pretty close to argument, which is oftentimes arguing on both sides of the equation. You know, we still see students who are in their undergraduate training, may be exposed to forensics deliberation where they go in favor of one thing against the the same thing. 
And, you know, hermeneutics doesn't have the kind of facetiousness where you can discover meanings that are completely in conflict with each other. But at the same time, I think it just opens your mind to the possibility that meaning is not pre-existent, well-formed, and you just need to find some sort of an algorithm for reaching it. Living Philosophy is brought to you by philosophytoyou.com, your public and applied philosophy hotspot for innovation, inspiration, and intelligence. Are you unhappy with your academic career? Do you need help transitioning to the next chapter? Hillary Hutchinson is a career coach specializing in helping academics leave academia. Academia is an unusual place with extremely rigid standards for promotion and due to structural issues with severely limited opportunities. The decision to leave academia can happen at any time in an academic career, whether just graduating with a PhD, deciding mid-career that the academic lifestyle or work content no longer appeals, or even figuring out what to do on retiring after a long academic career. Let Hillary help you now to figure out who you are, what you want to do, and start putting a strategic plan into place to achieve your own dreams. It's not about who you are. It's about who you want to be. Contact Hillary at transitioningyourlife.com or call 843-225-3224 to set up a complimentary appointment and find out more about how she works with clients. In this bold new book, The Infinite Staircase, What the Universe Tells Us About Life, Ethics, and Mortality, High Tech's best-known strategist, Jeffrey Moore, makes a groundbreaking contribution to the search for meaning in a secular era. Two questions fundamental to human existence have always been the metaphysical, where do I fit in the grand scheme of things, and the ethical, how should I behave? Religion is no longer a source of answers for many people, and nothing has replaced it. Moore uses his signature framework-based approach to answer these questions, taking readers on an intellectual roller coaster ride through physics, chemistry, biology, the social sciences, and the humanities. Along the way, he builds a metaphorical ladder that leads from the Big Bang to the need for ethical action in our daily lives. Combining an extraordinary range of scholarship with an accessible and entertaining writing style, The Infinite Staircase provides a coherent and unified platform for a full human life. The Infinite Staircase is available everywhere fine books are sold. Order your copy today. Understanding and relating to other people is key to the success of individuals and organizations, but doing so can be difficult and involves more art than science. Fortunately, there is a branch of philosophy called hermeneutics that explores how we can better understand and relate to others according to the stories we tell, what we say, and the histories and cultures that form who we are. Hermeneutics in real life is an online project that hosts virtual conversations with academics and professionals discussing how hermeneutics matters to our work and our lives and how it can be a catalyst for positive change. The conversations assume no prior background in hermeneutics and are hosted monthly, open to everyone and free of charge. To learn more about participating in these conversations, please visit our website at www.the letter H, the letter I, the letter N, the letter R, the letter L dot org. That's www.hinrl dot org. I was reminded of a time when I used to teach philosophy of religion and uh, like David, using some hermeneutical techniques to open up the student's mind. And as audience members have just heard, one of the principles of hermeneutics is really questioning the extent you know something. So I would tell my students, we're going to read something from a standard religious text. I want you to bracket out everything you know about this text and just look at the interplay of the characters. And we read the episode of The Fall with Adam and Eve and the serpent. And what they, what they, the conclusion they came to, they bracketed everything out they'd learned from Sunday school and these kinds of things. And the great conclusion they came to was, it seemed as if there is no one you can really blame for um, the so-called fall, which actually that word never appears in the episode. And so from that insight, we started to question why is this text so central? And actually what the, the the range of meanings were of this text, if we bracketed out all that stuff you had been told as a child. So it was a really interesting exercise and opened a lot of people up, including students who were who were very antagonistic towards religion. They started to see it in a, in a different way that became a bit more productive. So if I can turn to each of you, if you could comment on something specific within your career and 
field or subfield of philosophy where hermeneutics um, has been quite productive in, in showing a solution, a remedy, or opening things up in terms of better modes of questioning. Uh, as you know, I do environmental philosophy. And when I first began to study environmental philosophy, um, especially early on uh, in you know, its very short history, uh, one of the central questions is anthropocentrism and the problem of anthropocentrism. And so the debates, if you look through the literature, are do we take an anthropocentric view or a non-anthropocentric view? And if it's non-anthropocentric, uh, centric, is it biocentric? or ecocentric. And I had always been taught uh, by some of my mentors, and especially in hermeneutics, this binary either or approach is usually problematic. So when I first studied environmental philosophy, I was already suspicious of this debate that had gone on for 40 years in environmental philosophy about the difference between anthropocentrism and non-anthropocentrism. So one of the things that I looked at and thought about was, well, because there are multiple levels of meaning, and in philosophy, a fundamental thing we do is define your terms. What do you mean by anthropocentrism? And I did come across a few articles that did mention that uh, anthropocentrism sort of gets a bad rap because um, uh, it's, it's understood only one particular way. Humans are the center of moral concern, and that's wrong, and that's, that's that. But uh, Val Plumwood, an ecofeminist philosopher, talked about epistemic anthropocentrism that we can only see as humans see because that's, who we, that's our ontological place in the world. So I began to take hermeneutics and the principles of drawing that hermeneutic arc like Ricoeur does, and then also a general idea that we live in a very complex, nuanced world. Is it just a matter of finding the right center from which to reason? Uh, and then we can come up with our environmental ethics from, from doing that. So what I've tried to do in, in my work, I don't think I've convinced anyone yet but myself, but that you can take, uh, do this, this dialogue between not just a single center of concern, but multiple centers of concern and conflicting centers of concern, uh, whether it be with animals, aspects of what we call you know, the so-called natural world, and to try to maintain those conflicts in a creative way to then enter into a process of, of hermeneutic dialogue and hermeneutic discourse in order to find, as Gadamer would say, the universality of, of the problem and come to a place of mutual understanding from the beginning, a, a misunderstanding. One of the things Gadamer said is that Schleiermacher had said that hermeneutics is the art of overcoming misunderstanding uh, or avoiding misunderstanding. But for Gadamer, he said, it really begins in misunderstanding because misunderstanding presupposes the possibility of understanding. And then that takes place through uh, a dialogue. So bringing hermeneutics into that binary problem in environmental philosophy between anthropocentrism and non-anthropocentrism, for me, uh, gives a fresh new way to look at that problem. And, you know, I think one of the things I said in my dissertation is that environmental philosophers have been asking the wrong question for 40 years, and I don't know how well that will go over. But <laughs> I think some of the ways in which hermeneutics has been an enduring intellectual legacy beyond its, um, you know, original creators has been through these modern applications. And, um, you know, in, environmental studies is one of them. For me, what's been really quite a revelation is legal hermeneutics. So students in rhetoric, scholars of rhetoric are oftentimes drawn to legal rhetoric because that's where we see a lot of arguments. That's where we see high public and political stakes. And, and also that's where we see a lot of specialized discourse. So legal language is so technical in its own way, precisely because it tries to control the meaning and to create its own interpretive communities mm. that almost speak a certain language that tries to fix terms by way of avoiding ambiguity, by way of avoiding multiple interpretations and um, misunderstanding. But at the same time, I think legal hermeneutic scholars, like Georgia Warnke, for example, and others have done wonderful work showing just how inescapable these conflicts of meaning are, even in a highly controlled environment like the law. And you don't have to look specifically at legal documents or you know trials or narratives of trials. I have, for example, enjoyed a great deal, you know, similar to your experience, Todd. I sometimes teach Antigone to students and focus very much on having them suspend any kind of easy assessment of who's guilty and why. And to my surprise, they actually come back 
not particularly generously toward Antigone. So they, they tend to see Creon as someone who had a very well, very, very well thought out, very coherent political agenda. And, and ultimately, what else could he have done other than hold everybody accountable? But if you adopt the hermeneutic framework where it's simply not about who's right and who's wrong, again, but rather about potential incommensurability of purposes, of goals, of interpretive goals. And when you really can accept that incommensurability and think about how it can create radically different universes and different experiences and ways of living, then I think you have a richer understanding of the messiness of life. And for me, hermeneutics has been so fascinating because it honors the messiness of life. And it doesn't try to parse it out in very clear categories. It doesn't try to just simply describe it, which I think is one of my problems with some of the more ideology-oriented frameworks. It actually tries to own it and inhabit it. And I think students, perhaps now more than ever, because we live in such messy times, are likely to respond more to that message. I'd very much like to endorse Andrea's remarks, especially about uh, incommensurability. I was a little thrown by Todd's question when he asked us to comment upon whether there were key problems that hermeneutics allowed us to dismantle, because um, I'm not quite sure whether hermeneutics was ever intended to be a problem solver. Various theologians have pointed out problems are only better understood. They don't have answers. You can only understand them better. And I've always understood hermeneutics in that sort of way. This links to what Andrea was talking about with regard to incommensurability. A few years ago, I explored a a paper um, in Hungary with some colleagues in in which I thought hermeneutics could be used practically as a way of challenging absolutist views, terrorist views, extremist views with regard to absolutist claims to the truth. And I think hermeneutics is, is well armed with regard to trying to dismantle those claims insofar as it could be pointed out, for example, that any claim to absolute truth is in a sense a heresy on the hermeneutical supposition that all understanding is limited and finite. If so, no one can make an absolute claim about any way of life or any particular ethic. If I want to make, and I recognise the limits to my understanding of making such a claim, if I want to make that claim, in fact, I can only begin to understand what might be entailed in it by referring it to a dialogical partner. I begin to need to know the other, to know the truth I want to be committed to more fully. I can never know it absolutely myself. So in a sense, that um, combination of critique and creative accruition of thinking, I think the two go together, critique and creative accruition of thinking, make hermeneutical thought very productive. If I may be guilty of um, one rather partisan point, I wonder whether we're doing ourselves any good talking about a defence of hermeneutics as if it were a fixed noun rather than defending hermeneutical dispositions, which would be to much more towards um, expanding ways of thinking and doing, partaking, dialogical exchange, etc. In other words, creating events to be shared rather than trying to construct fixed definitions which somehow become stable element of an intellectual economy. I, I just feel that we have, perhaps should be talking more about the hermeneutical in terms of living experiences and how we deal with them rather than hermeneutics, which our substantive grammars always want us to move towards, so to speak. Seems like our <laughs> higher education system in the United States and and uh, and Britain sort of move towards the substantive for many, probably for many different reasons. You have to have something of substance you can refer to um, as something that somehow correlates with substance of meaning, and of course today's substance of economy in, in terms of the marketplace and and what you can have. And it, Nicholas raises an interesting problem, and um, one of the things I wanted to touch on in this podcast, which is probably a bit too much of workshop talk, as it were, is why you thought hermeneutics, because it's so central, as we've been trying to make the case and important, why it is it hasn't taken off. But um, in the interest of time, 
I think you can comment that you can comment on that if you wish, but I'd like to close things out for all three of you by asking each of you if you had to recommend a certain text or essay for someone who's new to hermeneutics, but certainly wants to dig into it from an academic or even from a popular view, what text or essay would you recommend? Uh, I thought about this. It's quite a, quite a difficult one, that, uh, in, insofar as many of the people that uh, we might addressing through your broadcast may not have any formal hermeneutical background. If they do, and they're interested in European hermeneutics and its engagement with other forms of religious thinking, I think reading an exercise in the confrontation of one form of religious thought with another is very intriguing and illumining of one's own perspective. So I would certainly recommend Hans Waldenfeld's book on absolute nothingness, which is a juxtaposition of Buddhist hermeneutics with Christian hermeneutics. It's a, a very interesting study. With regard to a more contemporary approach to hermeneutical understandings of the event, so to speak, as we live them out, and the historical ongoing consequences of such events, a practical book which hasn't actually got any philosophy in it at all, so it therefore might, might be appropriate, is a collection of historical writings by the German novelist Walter Kempowski, who produced a book which was a collective diary of persons in Germany, in the Allies, in the Soviet Union as well, on the last days of the Second World War. And if you wanted a multi-perspectival approach to a few days in history, and how those few days meant gigantically different things to groups of different groups of people. It is an extraordinary read, and uh, will just make any reader of it aware of the, the deep currents of ordinary, everyday events in our lives. So I would, I would recommend that as a very sobering read. And I have to say, I'm not sure at all what to say, Todd. This is a very difficult question. So let me offer two possibilities. I think a return to Wilhelm Diltai, a name we mentioned, is always rewarding because I think some of the fundamental questions that were picked up later by Hans-Georg Gadamer and, and, and Paul Ricoeur were very well presented by Diltai. And I think, you know, any collection of essays, he's not necessarily easily available to anyone who doesn't have German as a, as a tool. But any collection of essays by Delta, I think, would be helpful, especially essays in which he makes a distinction between interpretive sciences that are humanistic and then natural sciences that basically look fundamentally at the outer world rather than lived experience. Because it's a distinction that is both taken for granted and then later on much more complicated by applications of hermeneutics. But another text that I think might be interesting to revisit is actually not by anyone who directly identify with hermeneutics, but rather by an anthropologist, Clifford Geertz, the interpretation of cultures. I always find that very refreshing because it makes such a compelling case for why hermeneutical efforts to go with Nicholas's point are really not just about reified entities like, like texts, but rather spill into very large configurations like culture. And, you know, the excellent point that Geertz made that text can actually be more of a model and a metaphor for other kinds of symbolic activities was also one that was very important for Paul Ricoeur. So I myself plan to go back to the interpretation of culture and read it again and see what I think. Could I just make two comments on that? Geertz is an excellent recommendation. In that conjunction, Wolfgang Eser's book, The Range of Interpretation, is very diverse in the same respect. And Diltai is, is much more accessible than he was. There's a whole new English translation coming up with Cambridge University Press. So um, it's not as uh, difficult a, a series of texts to get hold of. No, I, I want to second uh, Clifford Geertz uh, as well. That was an excellent uh, recommendation. Nicholas and Andrea, I found this uh, really a daunting question. Wasn't <laughs> quite sure how to answer it, but uh, just a few recommendations. You know, Gadamer's Philosophical Hermeneutics, uh, especially the first few chapters, I think, is a very good readable uh, introduction. Vadimo wrote a book called Beyond Interpretation that I think the first chapter is actually an excellent introduction to what hermeneutics does. Uh, very, very good uh, text as well. From a standpoint of not so much religious hermeneutics, but symbolic hermeneutics, uh, Mirso Eliada's The Sacred and the Profane, 
I think is a is a good exercise in that. And uh, lastly, I'll just mention um, another kind of non hermeneutical text, but uh, Walter Benjamin's uh, The Storyteller, especially at the very beginning, he talks about storytelling, about narrative, and a phrase that I've come back to again and again and again, and also Richard Carney has talked about this, but the idea that narrative, and of course, narr- we didn't really get into narrative, but it's very much related, of course, obviously, to hermeneutics. Narrative gives us a shareable world. The ability to exchange stories gives us a world that we can share. And then Richard has taken that, you know, even uh, further in some of his work as well. But that is, you know, of course, then he goes on to talk about how to read, you know, certain certain text. But that idea of a shareable world uh, has, like I said, something I've come back to again and again. It seems like in these messy times, the idea of a shareable world is pretty far off the charts for something that we can uh, all accept as being a reality or being a potential step we can take. Let's admit we have a shareable world and see if we can get along with one another in that regard. It seems very far off, unfortunately. And I was hoping that the pandemic was going to bring us a bit closer together, but it's in many ways it has. In many ways, it's, of course, been polarizing, as many of us know, just from watching the news and various media outlets. I feel like I could have this conversation with the three of you for a very long time, but unfortunately our hour has come to an end. So I want to thank all three of you for your time and for the wonderful and stimulating conversation. And I wish you all the best in your academic careers and research. Thank you, Todd. Thank you, Todd. And best wishes to everybody too. Thank you, Todd. And it's been uh, really a joy having this conversation. If you would like to know more about the research, writings, and projects of Andrea Dechu with Tavoy, David Yutzler, and Nicholas Davy, please check out the written information for the podcast for their professional websites. You will also find their links to the various texts, ideas, and philosophers we discussed, as well as links to our sponsors. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please share, review, and spread the word. If you're interested in sponsoring Living Philosophy with a donation, please get in touch via the philosophy2u.com website. My name is Dr. Togne. Thank you for joining us on Living Philosophy, and I hope you'll join us for our next podcast. Until then, don't just read philosophy, live philosophically.